edge pieces, you prefer the middle. How many? Whether it's pizza or pie or whatever. How many, how many love the edge pieces best? And that's what you go for. That's the majority of us. Those are the holy ones. Okay, so that middle piece just seems that no one cuts their pizza like this. When you go to Pizza Hut or when you order from Domino's or whatever, it never comes like this. Because that's not how people eat it. Now, let me ask another question. How many of you are the middle child? Raise your hand if you're the middle child. Real high. So lots of middle children. Terry Smith's one we kind of picked on him in the early service. All right. I want to keep that in mind. Keep your hands up real high. I want, to say, I want to describe the middle child syndrome for you, okay? This is a real thing. And I'm see that, that, that picture like with, the, with the, the youngest kid who now is going to be the middle one, what he knows is he's going to have a syndrome for the rest of his life. He's going to have the middle child syndrome. Here's the description. It's a psychological condition. So people like Terry Smith have a psychological condition. That, that explains lots of things, right? That is said to exist among children born before and after another child, like in between. They are often plagued by negative feelings of emptiness. Raise your hand real again if you're a middle child. Raise your hand. I just, I just want to see real quick. Okay, so uh, like Norm, uh, okay, uh, Lyndall is. and Dennis, are you too? Okay, all right. So often plagued by negative feelings of emptiness, unworthiness, inadequacy, jealousy, characterized by low self-esteem, extreme seclusion from the outside world. Wow. All right. If left untreated... Dennis, you've been treated? You haven't been by his wife. Yeah, that's not counting. Uh, Lyndall hasn't been treated. Terry hasn't been treated. If left untreated in some cases, these things may lead to the child to developing psychotic behavior later in life. So if ever you come to church and the elder at the front door starts, just starts acting weird and treating you different, he's gone psychotic. He's a middle child. Middle child. It's that one that loses all the attention because the oldest child's the pride and joy. He was the only child for a long time. And the youngest one's the baby that needs all the help. And you're just kind of left in no man's land. Well, in Matthew chapter 27, in the reading of that, I kind of think there's three pieces of the gospel most often described, right? Death, burial, and resurrection. We say it so fast because it's a three-part sequence, and we just say it real fast. Death, burial, and resurrection. The middle piece is the one that kind of feels left out a lot. The middle piece is the one that kind of, you, 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 let, let's put it this way, he, he, he died on a Friday, death. He was raised on a Sunday. What's the, what do we call the Friday? Good Friday, okay. And he was raised on, Jesus, uh, on Sunday, Jesus was raised on Sunday, and we call it Easter. What do we call Saturday? Saturday. <laughs> nothing. No sad Saturday, no solemn Saturday, nothing. Because all he was doing was... Being dead. Burial. Right now he was buried on Friday, parts of Friday. He was buried on parts of Sunday. But that middle piece, that Saturday, you know, traditionally at least, how we describe it, he was Saturday, he was just buried. That's it. And so we have death, burial, and resurrection. And everybody kind of flies through that and, and doesn't think much about burial. And yet Matthew spends some quality time on the burial. And in fact, he's very concentrated in the details he gives because he's, what he knows, what Matthew knows is, I need to let people know this because when Christians have to defend the truth later on, they need this information. And he doesn't waste any words. Every detail matters. He's arming us with what it takes to answer some questions later on. And so when you have the capsule, the sequence of death, burial, and resurrection, don't go through it too fast. Don't focus on the death, on the cross, the resurrection. Don't forget to say burial real slow because it's important. And here are the details. First of all, a rich man named Joseph asked for the body of Jesus. 
The, for some reason, Matthew wants to give, he's not used to giving extraneous details. But in this particular case, he wants you to know not only was it a man, it was a rich man. And he goes straight to Pilate. Pilate's a governor. You don't just walk into a governor's residence and have a conversation. This man was apparently uh, uh, well-known enough and wealthy enough and positioned enough in his life that, that Pilate would listen to him. And he goes and he asks Pilate, I want the body. And Pilate lets him have it. And then Joseph, this man who went to get the body of Jesus, lays the body down and wraps it slowly in a cloth. Up close and personal, he wraps the entire body real tight in this cloth. Clean cloth. Joseph then buries the body in his own tomb. This is not an underground tomb. It's not a burial. It's, a, it's partly underground, partly above ground, and it's hewn out of rock. It's his own family plot. And he decides, I'm going to just use this one that was for my family. I'm going to put the body in it. And so there he goes. And then, and then he rolls this great stone over the entrance of it. Now, remember, none of these are wasted details. These are not unimportant. And there's a couple of Marys sitting across from him. I don't know how far, it doesn't say, but across from the entrance of the tomb. The two Marys are over here watching. They came the full way, and they're watching this grave. They know exactly where it is. That's an important detail. Just a second. And then the religious leaders go, and they, they ask Pilate, you know, this guy, they remembered something even the disciples didn't seem to remember. They remember that Jesus said, in three days I'm going to rise again. And so they come to Pilate, and they say, this guy is a total fraud. You just killed him. Thank you very much. You did us a favor. We want you to guard the tomb. Because we don't want the disciples to come at night, steal that body, and then go around saying he rose from the dead. Just go ahead and he puts a Roman guard, not a Jewish guard, a Roman guard at the tomb. And there you have all that's said by Matthew about the burial. What's the deal? Why is this so important? And one of the main reasons it's so important is that Matthew is saying, y'all, he was stone dead. He was absolutely lifeless. Now, there's a swoon theory that went around, and it still is said by some people who are skeptics. Really what he did was he faked his death, and then he revived later on. You know, some people do this. You'll hear this. They took a body to the morgue, and for whatever reason, it sits up and comes back to life. And it happens once in a while, these weird occasions. And so if Jesus died and then maybe an hour later he came back to life and it would be medically explained and there's ways to induce that kind of thing. But, but what Matthew is saying is, listen, he was wrapped in a linen cloth by a guy who wasn't one of the twelve and he was wrapped real tight. He was dead. It was obvious. They put him in a grave. They rolled the stone over it. Jesus was flat dead. And listen, that's very important because the centerpiece of our hope is a dead Jesus completely expended his life for us emptied himself of his blood fully dead that's not all it also proves that his body wasn't stolen some want to argue that we read Matthew chapter 28 beginning verse 11 to 15 that was the very theory that the Jewish leaders spread in the second century it's still going around and some of the early church fathers are arguing against it the idea is, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is, they, they, they want to go to Pilate and they want to get a Roman guard in order to disprove resurrection. What's ironic about that is, that guard also proved resurrection. That guard would not allow his, his responsibility to go undone. A Roman guard who let his responsibility go undone would be killed, Acts chapter 16. And besides, if the Jews did happen to steal the body, there's nothing better. In Acts chapter 2, that great celebrative moment when the gospel is preached for the first time, the centerpiece of it was, here's Peter saying, you know, David, David's buried in that grave. His bones are still there. But you know that grave they put Jesus in? It's completely E-M-P-T-Y, empty. And he rose from the dead. And if the Jews could have brought out the body of Jesus right there, just brought it out and presented it, the entire Christian faith dies before it ever starts. That's what I'd have done if I had a Jew that stole the body. They couldn't do that because it wasn't a stolen body. It was a resurrected one. 
Others in Matthew 28, for instance, say the disciples went and stole it and then just said it was resurrected. They buried it maybe in Andrew's backyard. So you got the apostle Andrew in his house and he buries the body in the backyard. And then he spends the rest of his life fighting for his life and even losing his life over presenting a truth that he knew was a lie. Would you do that? No one would. His body wasn't stolen and these details, these details are there to let us have some evidence. Listen, God doesn't ask us to believe blindly. He never asks us to believe in some story that's made up or to say, this is how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Well, now he does. But he doesn't just live within my heart. This is not a psychological, spiritual re uh, resurrection. This is a physical resurrection in history. He died and he was raised back to life. We're not talking about something that I use as a metaphor for my life. We're talking something that actually happened. And Matthew's given us these details. Also, it proves the women did not get the wrong address. That's an interesting thing. That people will say the women just forgot to go to the right. They went to the wrong tomb, and it was an empty one because it was never filled with anything. But what you know, and what Matthew says, is the two women followed, and they were right across from where Jesus was buried, and they saw it with their own eyes, and they went back on Sunday, and angels were there. <laughs> If Mary and Mary got the wrong address, so did God, right? And sent his angels to the wrong Oops, sorry, my GPS is a little off. I don't think so, right? And that's what Matthew's saying. He wants you to know our Savior that we gathered around the table to celebrate a moment ago, celebrate and remember, he was absolutely dead. No life. Buried in a grave. And it's the heart of the gospel, isn't it? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul comes along and he says, here's what I teach as of first importance. You want to know what the most important thing is, the, the most elementary and significant thing about the, about the truth is? You want to know what the first importance is? Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5. He was buried, and then he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to, and it gives a whole list of people he appeared to. I want you to notice these four parts right here. This is of first importance. And if we ever give this up or we ever compromise these truths, we have no Christian faith at all. He died for our sins, just like Scripture said. And then it, he's buried. Is that all that big a deal? It's of first importance. Now, it doesn't say according to the scriptures, and that's weird because it is. But the reason he said that is because this burial proves the death. Now, look at the next two lines. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared. That's the proof of the resurrection. Burial is proof of Jesus' death, like the appearances are proof of his resurrection. And both are central, absolutely central, fundamental, at the heart of first importance, Paul says. Don't leave burial behind. It's the proof of death. But it also, he really could have said, was buried according to the scriptures. That doesn't say a whole lot about burial. But what it does say is fascinating. Here's 1 first, first Corinthians. Here's, that's all right. Isaiah 53. By oppression and judgment he's taken away. As for, his generation who, as for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living. They, they said, he's not even a living thing, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made a grave. They made his grave with the wicked, wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he'd done no violence and no deceit was in his mouth. The thing that prophecy says, Isaiah 53, the most rich passage that, fulfill, that, that prophesies the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, goes along and talks about he was rejected and we considered him, we considered him awful and he was, he was mistreated, rejected, turned away and killed for the sins of someone else, though he was sinless. And the only thing it says about his burial is he was buried as a rich man in his death. Now that's a weird detail. Why would somebody who's poor, rejected, 
and considered a shame and embarrassment in his humanity. Why would he be given a rich man's burial? He wouldn't. It makes no sense to anybody. It's one of the, the prophecies that were, was spoken hundreds of years before Jesus died. And it was one of the prophecies that made no sense. Why would you put a person like that in a rich man's grave? Well, that's a weird question. But then when Matthew comes along and says, guess whose grave he put him in? He put him in Joseph of Arimathea. And how does he describe Joseph of Arimathea? He is a rich man. This could not be predicted. This makes no sense whatsoever. It was not, however, a guess. It is called a prophecy. It is God setting up a standard high saying, you want to see me meet it? And he meets it through Jesus. And we sit back and go, there ain't no way that's coincidence. Even his grave where he was buried was talked about by God beforehand, was set up way too high to be reasonable, and he nailed it. You know what it tells you? When Scripture speaks, it's the absolute truth. That's true in every single word. And here's how important it is. If the resurrection isn't true, none of Scripture is true. It rises and it falls on resurrection. If resurrection is not true, death, burial, and resurrection is not true. It's all a bunch of fable. But the other part is true too. If the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is true, every other single word is also true. One last thing. And I do say thing, last thing. Early service didn't give me credit. I bet this didn't spread around. When the sermon's long, early morning, everybody talks about, oh, you're in for a long one. But when it's short, no one says nothing. I bet no one told you it was 20 minutes and 15 seconds. I bet nobody told you that. See, I don't get credit when I serve it. Here's the last thing that I think the burial is talking about and why it's so important. Because yours... Romans chapter 6 verse 4 we were buried therefore with him by baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father we too might walk in newness of life the burial was essential he can't be raised to new life if he wasn't buried but he couldn't do it himself Jesus didn't rise from the dead he was dead. He was raised from the dead by his father. Completely dependent upon an outside force. When you are dead, you can't do anything. But when you're dead, someone else can do something to you. And I want you to know, people debate, is baptism a work or is it not? Yes, it's a work. It is a work of God, not of you. It is a work that he does in you to bring you back to new life. When you decide, listen, and people say, all you have to do to, is believe. That's not true. You have to believe enough to stake your life in it. You have to believe it so much that you're willing to say, I will die for this truth. I will die with this truth. I'm not just going to say, well, I believe it and let God save me. I'm going to believe it and I'm going to go to Jesus and say, you can kill me on the basis of this truth and you can make me come alive again on the basis of your truth. Do you believe enough to die for it? then do. It's called your baptism. Is the burial that important? Paul says of first importance. And if his burial is that important, so is yours. That's what he says. Romans chapter 6. Unless you think that's just a one-time shot, although that would be enough. Colossians chapter 2 verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism is proof of death. It's easy to say, I believe, I, I'll let him save me. It's, it's a little more to say, you know what, I believe enough. I'm willing to kill myself over it. Or better yet, to let myself be killed in order to honor it. 
So let's get practical as we wrap this up, okay? Jesus had to die and be buried to experience resurrection. And both were essential to salvation. If, not, if that didn't happen, nothing else matters. He had to die and be buried for his resurrection to matter. Second, Jesus had to die and be buried to fulfill the scriptures, proving every single word he says true. And finally, Jesus had to die and be buried to be raised to please the Father and be alive again. So must you be. It was incredibly important. It's not some middle child syndrome where they just throw it in there, right? And kind of ignore it after that. It's not a minor chord between two major moves. It's not that. It was critical to the fulfillment of the entire plan of God. And it's critical for you. Because he was buried, he was raised. And this morning, the possibility remains for you. It remains for you that you can believe. And you can believe and you can go to the Father and say, I believe what Jesus did for me. He's the Son of God who came into the world to die for my sins. But I want to believe so much that I invest my life in it. And here's the thing. The rest of your life, you'll be living out that burial and resurrection just like Jesus did. He came back to life and rose to life. And now he's living evermore, right? He's living forever. You have that same possibility this morning. You'll be buried in the waters of baptism, rise to walk a new life by the power of God's cleansing through the unity with his son. And the rest of your life, you'll be living out the implications of that baptism. But you'll always look back. You'll always look back and say, it happened on the day I was buried and rose from the dead. There's an objective time in your life you look back upon. And the rest of your life, you're trying to live it out. Does anybody need to die today? Anybody really, really willing to say publicly, I believe so much I'm willing to die on it and live for it. We'd love to be witnesses this morning if there's anybody ready to be buried as we stand and sing to encourage you.